Hello and welcome to another episode of GraphQL Radio. My name is Nicholas Burke, and our guest today was the keynote speaker at this year's GraphQL Summit, Jason Langsdorf um, from IBM. Welcome to the show, Jason. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. All right. Uh, yeah, I'm having you on today, and I think we have a couple of things to talk about. Uh, of course, we're going to talk about the talk that you gave at GraphQL Summit, uh, which basically discussed how you're using GraphQL at IBM, and also mm -hmm. the ideas that you have for schema stitching and the tools that you're developing in that space. But let's start mm -hmm. with the basic introduction and like your story of how you got into programming. So um, when did you write the first line of code and what was the programming language you were using? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my, my story is a little bit weird because I, I came into programming sideways. Um, when I was young, I was in a, a rock band and we were, we were touring constantly. You know, we played about 200 shows a year for a couple of years. Wow. And during that time, we didn't make any money. Um, but we needed to do things like make tour posters and build websites and stuff like that. So I uh, was the only one in the band who felt confident enough to try it. So I designed our tour posters. And then the first line of code that I wrote was um, some CSS to customize a MySpace page. Nice. Um, and from the, the CSS that led me to like, okay, well maybe I could build an actual website. And then, you know, I, I didn't want to be the only one who could update it. So I started learning PHP. Um, and then I learned like, action script because I thought, you know, I was going to be a genius and build a bunch of flash websites. Obviously that didn't work out. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, since then it's just been kind of a wandering road. Like I did PHP WordPress development for a while. And then now I'm more on the, I mean, ostensibly I'm a front end developer though. I don't do a whole lot of front end code right now. <laughs> Mostly I work in, in node at the moment doing a lot of, uh, like backend node server stuff. All right. Wow. Um, super interesting story. And indeed, probably not the most conventional way of getting into programming in the first place. That's super nice. So like, how did you then end up in your current job at IBM? And what actually is it that you do there um, concretely? What's your role? So um, my official job title at IBM is uh, I'm a uh, senior front end developer. Mm -hmm. And the, the acting role that I have is, is more of a kind of systems architect like, or a, an application architect. I'm doing a lot of work on building foundational tools to make sure that the rest of our team is able to work on features and product very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I came to this job because I was working with, I guess I, I was speaking. Um, I, w I used to speak at this conference before it stopped. It was called uh, The Future of Web Design. Mm -hmm. And they had a handful of different shows that they would play. But every year I would go to the same conference and I had a crew that I would meet up with every time. One of the people that I would meet up with was um, a guy named Robin Cannon. And so Robin has been a technical manager at IBM now for about three years, I think. Mm -hmm. And when I, my contract before this one came to a close, they didn't really have anything else for me to do. And so I was looking for something new. I, I talked to Robin and I said, hey, do you know anybody who's looking for contractors? And he said, well, why don't you just come work for IBM full time? And I, I laughed and I told him, you know, I told him absolutely not. And, uh, <laughs> and then he said, no, seriously, let me tell you about the project. And so he started describing the, the work that IBM is doing to move out of being a, uh, like a legacy, slow, kind of horribly corporate enterprise company mm -hmm. and trying to move more toward, you know, modern and uh, agile and, and actually using like good practices. So things like when I came in, they were in the midst of a, a transition to building primarily React components. Um, mm -hmm. They released a design system called Carbon. Uh, the Carbon design system is a, is a like open source component library. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're making an effort. Um, and I thought that was pretty exciting because you know, it's, it's cool to go to a company that like starts out cool and is, is already doing all the cool things from day one, but it's, it's a really interesting problem. Like how do you walk into a company that's only just starting to realize that any of this stuff is even possible mm -hmm. and then help shape the culture that convinces people who are very entrenched in like, no, we do things Java. We do things exactly this way. Um, how do you get them to turn around and say, Oh, okay, well maybe some of this new stuff is okay. Maybe it is better and mm -hmm. we should look toward the future. Um, and it was, it was that, not so much the actual product, but the, the promise of the challenge that sounded really, really interesting. And that's what got me to, to actually sign on with IBM. Okay. Uh, when was that? When did you join them? 
Uh, I've been at IBM since October of 2016, so a little over a year now. Okay, okay, cool. Um, all right, and um, what was your first contact with GraphQL? Um, have you already been working at, uh, at IBM at that time, or was that during your time as a contractor? Um, when did you first get in touch with GraphQL? Uh, I think I'd read about it kind of in passing in the days of what, like when Relay was first launched. Mm -hmm. I, I looked at it and I was like, ah, this is too hard. Yeah. Um, and so I, I like played with it a little bit, but I couldn't get my head around it. And, and I just, eventually I just kind of walked away and did something else. And, uh, and then I think right about the time that I started at IBM, we were looking at a way to solve this really complex problem, which is IBM is a microservices architecture. There are 30 plus people or 30 plus teams, um, just on the product I work on. I work on the IBM cloud platform. Mm -hmm. And so we have all of those teams are exposing and accessing data and they're all doing it in different ways, or at least they, they historically, they were all doing it in different ways. Typically it was kind of a, a disjointed collection of rest APIs that were like proxied through various different places to give some semblance of a unified API. And like people did a lot of work to make our rest APIs good, but they were still, very difficult. And so I saw that problem and we were trying to figure out like, how do we make this easy for our front end teams? Um, and that was when I really started looking at GraphQL. That was what made it. Um, that was kind of when I saw the promise, I, it was my light bulb moment. Where I was like, Oh, okay. So this is how we can solve this problem. Because one of the issues we were seeing is that we didn't have that clear separation of like, this is a UI and this is a data source. It was like, well, the UI like does some business logic and it's like making these proxied requests, but then it also exposes API endpoints. And so you get all this goofy stuff going on where like you get half the data from one endpoint and then it gets turned around and re-exposed with additional data. And so you don't know which endpoint is actually the source of truth. And like our API contracts internally were really unstable. Um, so GraphQL was like, okay, well we can like we can separate all this. We can make it into like a UI does no has no idea where its data comes from. Mm -hmm. It's just going to accept an object, and that object is going to get rendered to screen. Mm -hmm. And the back end, we aren't going to get all of these back end teams to work together, but maybe we can get them to um, consolidate around like one place to expose that data. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where the the idea for Gramps kind of came into place. Okay, so um, you had mentioned there that you were trying to put um, like uh, contracts for the client server communication around your APIs. Uh, how did you approach that uh, prior to using GraphQL? We had a, I mean, we still do use REST pretty extensively and mm -hmm. we're making an effort as a company to get better at writing Swagger docs. So okay. mm -hmm. most of what we're doing is built around open API specs. The challenge that we see is, is that a lot of teams still aren't actually generating their APIs from the open API spec. They are maintaining them separately as a set of docs. Mm -hmm. And so we end up with things being slightly out of date or severely out of date. Um, and in some cases, you know, if deadline pressure comes up, they don't write the docs at all. They just write the APIs. And so we, we um, typically that's where we've struggled is, is you know, we, we try to do documentation but the thing about documentation is that if it's not automatic, it's the very first thing to go. And that was another reason that GraphQL seems so promising is even if you phone it in and don't write any docs, you can at least see what the data is. Like even if you're not clear on what that data is for or have any insight into like why it's present, you at least know that it's there, which is not always the case with REST. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, I think. This makes a lot of sense. Um, so in terms of your like uh, path that you had at IBM in adopting GraphQL, what were the first couple of steps that you took and what were the opportunities which you saw in the first place which you hoped to achieve? Um, so I came at GraphQL from the front end side. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing that I saw was, I think I read an article where somebody was talking about optimistic updates. And that was like, when I saw that and when I saw the, the automatically bundled loading pattern, that was the thing that I was like, okay, this is like, this is a thing that we should do. So we looked at one of our, our one of our UIs um, on the, the platform is like pretty small and, and relatively simple. So we decided as our proof of concept, we were going to pull everybody together and spend about two weeks and just rebuild the whole UI. And so we wrapped uh, a couple APIs in GraphQL. Mm -hmm. We uh, we rebuilt the whole UI in React, and 
implemented like a skeleton loading patterns and uh, you know a couple other things and showed this really uh, really positive correlation between like implementing GraphQL and front end performance. Um, it was all perceived performance, you know, we weren't like making any servers faster, obviously, but the, the UI felt faster when we did it that way. Mm -hmm. So after we did that, we demoed it around. We didn't end up actually using that work because it was, uh, it was somebody else's team. Like we didn't want to go steal their product, but then we found a, a UI that we actually owned. And so we took that UI and we did an experiment where we took the slowest page on the UI. And this is actually the slowest page in our platform. And we went through and rebuilt it using GraphQL and React uh, with the Apollo stack. Rebuilt the whole thing, and by the time it was done, we had improved its actual speed by about 250%. And we were able to improve its perceived loading speed by over 3,000%. And the, the reason for that is because prior to that, what was happening is that when you loaded that page, it would show a loading spinner in the middle of the page. And that loading spinner would run until the very last query had finished running. And that query sometimes took 30 seconds to run. <clears throat> okay. um, so in certain cases, you would look at a loading spinner for 30 to 35 seconds. And if you were on it had a particularly huge amount of data in your account, upwards of a minute, you would just sit and look at that loading spinner and wait. And you were, you're not sure if the page held or you know any of that. So when we what we implemented was that in about a second, you get a skeleton loading component that shows you everything on the page and then the data renders as it arrives. So only that one slow section stays a loading component for 30 seconds or whatever. And everything else is, uh, is rendered you know, almost instantly or near instantly. Um, and we got some good other, other benefits too, like the client side caching means that when you navigate to another tab in that view and then back, you're not making those queries from scratch. You get that data straight back. And so you get this like feeling of instant um, transition between pages. So the, by doing that, our, uh, we, we got the executives excited. So once we showed that, we demoed that around and people who weren't developers started looking at it and going, holy, holy shit, this is a thing we need to start doing like right now. Um, and the, the front end developers who got to work with it were also super excited because they got to build something very quickly. Um, mm -hmm. there, there wasn't this long feedback loop of, okay, I need this API. And then you wait for two to three to four weeks for a backend team to get around to building the API endpoint that you need so that you can pick up your UI again and keep working. Instead, we just mocked it up and said, hey, we need this data. We're using mock data, we're building quickly. And we were able to get a UI built, you know, like I said, we rebuilt this entire UI inside of six weeks. Um, and this is like a big page that we had to rebuild. And since then it was rebuilt in a weekend by one guy who was like, ah, there's a better way to do this. And so he just like, he did a, a simplified UI in about, um, he did it in like three days. And it was because we laid this foundation where it was really, really simple to take things apart and put them back together. Um, and you didn't have these long feedback loops where you had to wait for the back end to give you something so that you could continue moving on the front end. We decoupled the front and back end, and I think that was probably the, the single biggest win. Cool. Wow. Um, and what were a couple of the initial friction points that you hit when you were starting out with GraphQL in the beginning? So it seems like you were um, pretty fast in convincing the, the right people that GraphQL is the right technology choice for you at this point, but um, were there points of friction or any challenges uh, and roadblocks which you hit along the way? Yes, um, so we just kind of did it. Like my, uh, my manager is that guy, Robin Cannon, the, the guy that I've known since before I, I went to IBM. And right. so he and I just agreed that what we were gonna do is, is kind of adopt a fast forgiveness model when we came in here. And so we know that it's the right thing to do. And, and we, had good, we had good data that suggested that what we were trying to do was going to make a, a noted improvement. Um, so the reason we were able to do it so fast is that we didn't tell anybody we were doing it. We just did it. And so once we did it, we rolled it out into production, um, showed the, the benefits, made the measurements, and then we took it around and we started showing people. And the pushback was, I mean, first the pushback is, you know, like I'm, 
I'm not young. Like there are people who are 10 years younger than me working at IBM, which still kind of makes me self-conscious, but compared to some of the, <laughs> compared to some of the people who are working, um, who've been on this back end for, for years and years, you know, they've been at the company for 20 years. I look like some young hotshot who's been at the company for three months and decided that he's going to change everything. And, yeah. and you know, they've, they've seen me before. Like there have been people coming through the company who are young and ambitious and they have some crazy idea and they get halfway through it and they run into a roadblock and it just gets abandoned. Right. So they thought that I was going to be one of they like, they thought the GraphQL was going to be another one of those. It's a fad. It's going to get halfway implemented. It's going to seriously complicate the process. And when it gets hard, people will just walk away from it and we'll have this like abandoned half completed data layer that just makes things harder. So that was the primary pushback was like, how do we know that you're actually going to pull this off? Um, mm -hmm. So we had to get our team, um, you know, we, we socialize this really well in our team. Uh, mm -hmm. We, unfortunately, IBM is bad at silos where there are multiple parts of our, our console where, um, are you familiar with the term, the, the concept of the bus factor? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, so, uh, uh, yeah, I think it refers to like how many people of your team have to get hit by a bus and would not be available anymore as so right. that uh, you can still understand your system, basically, and understand your system. Right. And so in a lot of parts of our console, the bus factor is like one or two. Mm -hmm. And that's a terrible place to be when, that's you know, problem. I mean, the, these people are on pager duty, like. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They they're up at 5 a.m. to solve some problem in in Tokyo or whatever. Like it's not a it's not a fun place to be. And so we worked really hard to make sure that there were multiple people. Like the bus factor on our GraphQL stuff is is over 12 at this point. Like anybody who's working on it would be able to pick it up and go. And we're expanding that number all the time. We're doing education to onboard people to it. And I think that's what is going to make this something that, that expands because I think a lot of the reason that these um, like ambitious projects fail is because teams implement them with like one person. One person gets a wild hair and goes super hard and chases this goal and then they get reassigned somewhere and nobody understands how it works to pick up that torch and run. Mm -hmm. So by making the, the base of knowledge broader and making sure that like, I'm not the only person at IBM who knows how GraphQL works, you know, I like, I can go on vacation and the system continues to run and people continue to submit pull requests and, and build on it. Um, and by doing that, we've made it something that I think has a chance to really develop legs and, and become a, a core part of our offering. Um, so it sounds like the, the major challenges you hit there were on a social and organizational level um, more than yes. on the technical level, actually. So was the adoption of GraphQL on a technical, uh, on a technical level um, more fluent then, or um, were there any issues with that as well? Um, I mean, I think that the, the technical adoption of anything is always hard because you start out and, it, and any new technology has the promise to solve all your problems. You know, you, you, you switch from jQuery to React because React has solved all the problems. And then you find out that React actually has a lot of doors and corners that weren't checked before you ran headlong into the stack, right? right. Um, and, and so GraphQL is the same way. We, we looked at GraphQL and, and the initial gut feeling is, oh my God, this solves all of our problems. But it doesn't. It, what it's doing is it's transferring the complexity from the client to the server. And the thing that we really struggled with is um, GraphQL feels like something that was written by extremely smart backend developers who were sick of front end developers having trouble with data. So they said, let's build a really easy to use client side data querying system. And they made great docs for it. They made really easy developer ergonomics. And then on the server side, they were like, ah, oh, whatever. If you're smart enough to use it, you can figure it out. And so, so we have a lot, uh, there's a, a big lack of knowledge, a big lack of, um, of tooling around building good servers. And I think that there, you know, companies like GraphQL are doing a great job of solving this problem. And like the, the latest generation of Apollo server is doing a good job of solving this problem. I think Relay Modern even like made a great step toward making it less complex yeah. to build, um, with, with Apollo Sir. So, I mean, it's all like basically what we ran into that there was no conceptual model for how do you work on a GraphQL server that spans 30 teams? Um, you know, at the time that we started working on this, the concept of schema stitching was like a question in an issue somewhere. It, it had no code behind it. There was no anything. And so we, we ended up doing it in like 
a really low tech way, which I'm still actually a big fan of. We, we talked about this a little bit earlier uh, through text, but um, what we ended up doing was building our data sources as, as close to text files as we could. So they export a schema, and at the time, schema stitching didn't exist. So our schemas would just extend the query type. Mm -hmm. And at the end, we would literally concatenate those strings together to end up with one big schema. Mm -hmm. And that then allowed us to like, you know, we'd combine the resolver objects, combine the, the mock object, and feed it all to an Apollo server uh, instantiation call. Mm -hmm. And we, we codified this into a pattern. And the pattern is what we're calling gramps. Mm -hmm. um, so, so gramps... So, so, oh, so I... So I do want to speak about grams in a bit, but before I um, at least want to close off with our oh, sure. discussion about like how uh, GraphQL works for you now on an organizational uh, an organizational level, um, and in terms of like the the processes and the team structure, like um, what are the conclusions which you came to, um, and mm. what are the, the the changes which you had to introduce on an organizational level. Um, how did you change your processes and how do you manage like schema um, ownership? Um, who decides what makes it into the schema and how are these things uh, decided? So at the moment, we, we've decided that we want GraphQL to be um, as thin a wrapper as possible. So we do, we're not trying to create too much work for our front end teams or our back end teams. And so the, the conclusion that we reached is that our GraphQL layer is just a really thin wrapper on top of our, our APIs. Mm -hmm. So if an API exposes an organization's endpoint and that organization endpoint returns like an ID, a name, and members, then our GraphQL schema is an exact replica of that. It's gonna return, it's gonna have a get organizations call that will return a type that is ID, name, and members. Mm -hmm. And we did that specifically because when something is properly spec'd in the open API, you can actually auto-generate GraphQL schemas off of that, which makes our life really easy. There's a, there's a tool from like internal IBMs, but there's also a tool that I saw, um, I don't remember where it was, but somebody was talking about it on Twitter that would take an open API spec, and because open API is typed, they can generate a GraphQL schema off of it. Um, so in having that, we, we're able to then say like, GraphQL is just an extension of the API contract. If you define an API well, GraphQL will mirror that. And as a result, the backend team who builds that API, they own the GraphQL API as well. Um, how that works in practice is that we have a central GraphQL microservice. That microservice is um, the actual endpoint. So when you go to like our console slash GraphQL, that's, that's that microservice. But that microservice doesn't have any data. The only schema that it exposes is a single query that gives you the, the version of Gramps that is running on that GraphQL microservice. Mm -hmm. um, what it does is it imports each team's data sources from uh, an independent NPM package. So they fully manage those NPM packages. Um, and we have them all set up on semantic release. So whenever they push changes, it automatically bundles and pushes a, a new update with a new version number. And what I'd like to do is eventually automate this. Currently it's manual. You just bump the package version in the GraphQL microservice. Mm -hmm. And as long as the tests pass, we ship it. Um, it'll automatically ship. There's no manual review process. Cool. Um, and so what's great about this, our data sources are small enough. And the way that we write them uh, is basically the GraphQL way. So it's all functional. So it's extremely easy to keep 100% test coverage on a data source. Uh, it's one of my favorite things about GraphQL is how incredibly easy it is to test. And so all of our data sources currently run at above 90% test coverage, which shouldn't be an anomaly inside of IBM currently. It's kind of an anomaly. Um, and our GraphQL microservice runs at 100% test coverage. So we have really high confidence that when you ship a change, if our tests pass, we can send it to production. Um, and because all the data sources are distinct, you can't ship a change in your data source that will break one of mine. Um, so all the teams have confidence that their data sources are treated as distinct units, even though they're uh, exposed through a common endpoint. 
And so by, by setting up those safeguards and, and putting it in such a way where there is no gatekeeper, um, nobody gets to say whether or not the GraphQL stuff goes. It's a fully democratic uh, system. Mm -hmm. If you have a change to push and you push a PR and somebody approves it, I don't care who the person is that approves it. If you, if you push it and approve it and the test pass and your coverage is above the level, the threshold that we set, I don't care. It's sh like ship it. It's good. Cool. Um, and if it turns out that it breaks, we'll, we'll run a, a blame and figure out who did it and talk to him about how not to do it again in the future. And, you know, it's it, like, you know, we've got several stages of like our, our internal console and then our on deck console and then our actual like production server. So it's going to, you're going to have to try pretty hard to get any actual breaking changes through the production. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's something where we believe that treating internal code as open source, where anybody who wants to change it should be able to, regardless of your business unit or your team, um, that's how you build healthy coding systems. That's how you build knowledge share and avoid those knowledge silos. So that was our approach, and that's what's led us to have, um, you know, that, that's why we have it. That's why cool. it's working. Yeah, I think that um, that was extremely insightful, and um, it's... It's really interesting to see how um, like the introduction of a technology can change the um, ways how we work internally at a company and the structures. Uh, so I think that um, this might be a model that um, can also be adopted by other companies who are having the same issues um, that you guys had initially. So now let's move on a little bit uh, to the next topic um, which is really the the highlight of today's episode i think and that's uh, schema stitching and the framework that you built for that um, grants mm. but maybe we can start with like a general introduction to the topic because i think that schema stitching by itself still is kind of on the cutting edge of the graphql ecosystem at the moment mm. the, the the tools and practices around it are still evolving and um, so are the ideas in it actually um, so what is your current understanding of schema stitching and like the the major um, components it contains so I would I, I, I think it would be important for me to as we start this off um, make a, a distinction because mm -hmm. schema stitching itself is the idea of taking two distinct GraphQL schemas and putting them together in a way that kind of merges those concepts. So if you have uh, the, the example that gets used that I, that I think is great is like the universe API getting a, an event and then using the weather API so that you can query on an event, but then also have a field on that event that tells you the weather mm -hmm. um, that pulls from weather. So, so you don't have to make two queries to get that data and then manually merge those together. Right. Um, so that's what schema stitching is in my head. Mm -hmm. And that's actually not what Gramps does. Okay. Um, so what, what Gramps does is, in fact, um, it, think of it less as merging those schemas and more as like modularizing discrete pieces of a large schema. So the way that I look at it is that, um, for example, inside of IBM, we have uh, like a huge Cloud Foundry instance. And so we've wrapped all of the Cloud Foundry API endpoints in one data source mm -hmm. that has no, it doesn't do any stitching. It's not connected to anything else. It's completely standalone. Mm -hmm. um, and then we export that as a data source that you can then import into your system. Mm -hmm. um, we then have like another one for the way that we handle our authentication. Those are a discrete set of, of API endpoints that we wrap and then we export the GraphQL schema for those as a, a different data source. Mm -hmm. When those get merged together in Gramps, we're not actually making any relationships between them. We're just exposing both schemas under the same endpoint. Okay. Um, so what, what is possible is that after you've imported those two endpoints, you could then use the schema stitching API that's mm -hmm. exposed by, by Apollo to make relationships between those two distinct mm -hmm. uh, data sources. So effectively, what we're actually doing is it's less of the schema stitching and more of a, of a um, complementary or, com or, I guess, com competition for the um, remote schema mm -hmm. functionality. Well, so mm -hmm. rather than having to import a remote schema and then um, pull, that, like, pull that in and then parse it, you have to do, you can do a, um, a distinct like, local data source that gets loaded in. Mm -hmm. And then that, so it's, it's just one less network request mm 
that you can use to, to do it that way. So it, instead of doing it at runtime, you're getting that external data source at build time from an NPM pack. Right. Okay. If, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so um, remote schemas are then not actually relevant in grams. Well, they they can be used together. So for example, if um, if you didn't if you wanted to use the GitHub API, mm -hmm. and GitHub hasn't exposed a a public like Gramps data source, mm -hmm. it probably doesn't make sense to try to maintain your own data source that wraps the, the GitHub API. Okay. But where it would make sense is like, for example, if you wanted to go and get uh, data from, I don't know, uh, uh, some company that doesn't have a GraphQL endpoint, mm -hmm. you could build a wrapper as a Gramps data source for their REST API. Um, or if you are a company, and you wanted to make your data sort your your data uh, kind of developer friendly. What you could do is build your internal GraphQL endpoint as a Gramps data source, and then put that Gramps data source on NPM, so that rather than me having to like do a, a remote merge with the GraphQL from GitHub, um, I would be able to import the GraphQL data source, also maintained by GitHub, preferably the same code base, because they could they could just expose their own data source at slash GraphQL um, or a subset so that you don't get internal admin APIs, things like that. Um, and that, that way I'm using officially maintained code rather than a wrapper that I had to write myself. And I see a lot of examples where people are, they're effectively rewriting parts of the GitHub schema to make their examples work. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the, the goal of Gramps is to try to, to create a standard that we can argue about as a community and hopefully come to an understanding that if all of us were to agree to expose data sources using this shape, um, and the shape is really simple. It's you expose a, a name for the, the context, kind of like a namespace. Mm -hmm. um, you expose your um, type defs, and then you expose a context object and some mocks, so mm -hmm. resolvers and mocks. And by exposing those pieces, Gramps is able to stitch those together into one schema. You can also just consume those however you want, um, you don't need to use Gramps necessarily because none of it is proprietary, like Gramps specific code. It's just like, it's just an object that has mm -hmm. pieces of GraphQL data. Um, if we as an industry were to standardize around one way of writing data sources and exposing our schemas and resolvers as they relate to each other, it would then allow us to build these, uh, you know, we could basically write little adapters where any data source from any GraphQL server, if it were exposed open source, could be plugged into any other data source or any other GraphQL system, um, the same way that we use NPM packages today. So rather than me having to write my own version, um, I can then go and say, all right, I wanna build something. I'm gonna use the, the, you know, the GitHub API and the Universe API, uh, but what I ultimately wanted to do is like, you know, find like code events for people that are relevant to the, the types of code they're writing. Mm -hmm. um, so you can pull in all of those things and under the, the hood, you would do your own, you know, schema stitching and all that, but it doesn't require all this remote schema fetching and all these runtime operations. It's just all done at build time, put together for you. So you've got this clean uh, data source, like all built locally in your app that you can then ship just to make things nice and fast and portable. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you as a, a company owner could then expose your data source so that somebody else would be able to do exactly the same thing. They could consume your service and, uh, and like expand on it and, and kind of remix it and release something that way. Yeah. So I think that's really the future of GraphQL, um, that at some point we should be able to make a GraphQL API reusable in a very easy and simple way and then share that just through NPM and other people can pull that in and they get the same functionality for free, basically. So it's all about like reusing and sharing GraphQL APIs that have already been implemented. Exactly. Yeah, because one of the things that I, I think REST did really well is um, you would find these like REST helper libraries for everything. And so if I wanted to use almost any public API, I can go and find a node library that wraps all the endpoints. It gives me this like really clean adapter to do all the CRUD operations inside of their API. Mm -hmm. um, if we can kind of make that same move, GraphQL can make it even cleaner because now you don't necessarily have to like, like in, in an app now you'd have to import the adapter for the REST API and then write a bunch of code to handle how that API is, is interacted with. With GraphQL, if we write these adapters in a way that's portable, mm 
where we can share them with each other, then when I import your adapter for a GraphQL endpoint, I don't have to write any code for how it works. The query is just there, and it just operates properly. Um, and so I think that's a really cool way of doing it, where we, we have this huge potential to um, take the, the ease and the developer experience that we created on the front end of GraphQL, where we've got this like, amazingly improved developer experience. It's so fast, it's so easy, it's close to zero config. If we can do the same thing on the back end, that's I think where we like see it explode onto the internet. If we can make this easier for back end developers, I think we take the, like this is the next revolution in, in data management, you know? Um, so that, that's, I, I don't know that Gramps is gonna be the answer, but I hope Gramps starts the conversation or is part of starting the conversation. I know that GraphCool is also what was the, you, you just released an article and you had... Um... Yeah, right, so uh, we are um, basically doing all of our work in terms of uh, a schema system on top of GraphQL tools. So uh, we are co uh, cooperating a lot there with the Apollo team. And mm -hmm. um, we kind of want to like shape the ideas around schema stitching at the moment. So we are releasing a, uh, um, we're releasing a series of blog posts on schema stitching, where the first one was about um, uh, remote schemas, where we introduced mm -hmm. the idea of having a schema that you could just um, pull in into your code, um, but uh, where you still like, um, you use this remote schema as a proxy to interact with the actual GraphQL API which lies behind it and which you have to reach out through the network. Um, and then the next post which we just released this week was about schema delegation. So it's kind of this idea mm -hmm. to rewire resolvers internally or of two different schemas. So you've got one resolver but you um, uh, just like forward the execution of an incoming query to a different resolver and let that mm -hmm. one handle it. And the next one that we're going to uh, publish probably next week is about schema merging, the idea of mm -hmm. taking two schemas and basically forming the union of them. But then like, um, how do you deal with naming conflicts, for example, and trying to mm -hmm. outline these issues um, and uh, show the tooling that is available today, how you can get started with these topics. Um, yeah. Um, so I, 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 it, I love it because like, it's such a, um, like I, I love how much work is going into solving this problem. Yeah. And I love how differently the solutions are being done. Cause, cause like your solution is to, um, is to work with like the, the schema delegation and like all these resolvers. My solution was you can't publish a data source unless you namespace all your types. <laughs> yeah. and, and that actually um, would have been my next question, which I wanted to ask you about Grams. And I think you kind of um, alluded to it quickly before, but like how do you deal with naming conflicts in uh, Grams when you have two schemas which have the same type? Mm. But I think you just said it, um, since each schema has its own namespace, basically you don't run into naming conflicts at all. Right, and in the in the event that you ran into like two data sources with the same namespace, you would end up with a like some kind of a delegation function or what would be better would be to just submit a pull request that changes the namespace to be unique. Right. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the, it's kind of like solving the problem with a blunt instrument. But in, in my experience, what I've found is like technical solutions get hard because if you, if you ship a ton of like different, um, like discrete data, like, what were you calling them? You were calling them uh, adapters, I think. Mm, what or are you referring to? Or the, you had like a, a package for GitHub and a package for um, Yelp. Um, GraphQL bindings. Bindings, yeah. So, so when you ship those bindings, they're doing a lot of like complex technical stuff, right? So when the next version of like, you know, Apollo Tools 3.0 comes out and there's a, a huge advancement to the way that merge schemas and delegation works and all that. Every single one of those bindings now requires a lot of maintenance mm -hmm. um, because you have to go in and rip out all of that stuff to update to the new API. Mm -hmm. the, the goal that we wanted to, uh, we wanted to go at the data sources in a way that would be as future proof as possible. And we did that by removing all of the, the, um, the technology that we could. So Gramps is a, like a centralized place to put all the complexity so that if we end up with an, a GraphQL tools 3.0 or a, an Apollo server 3.0 that violently changes the way that uh, the servers are built, mm 
the data sources themselves most likely will not need to change. Mm -hmm. So we would just update the way that Gramps parses those or the way that it exposes them to the updated server so that you could you know, continue to use all of those data sources and not worry about whether or not they're 2.0 or 3.0 compatible because they're not smart. They're just, they're just dumb data files with pure functions and those, those can be operated however. Um, so, and I, I don't know that there's a right or a wrong answer there because obviously going to the point where there is no technology in the data sources also eliminates some of the advanced features. So, you know, is it, you know, my gut is always do it the simplest way possible until there's a really, really strong reason to do it hard. Um, and you know, my, my solution for it would probably end up being like have a data source and then a, a package that's actually designed to wrap that data source with whatever complicated logic before it gets fed into the, the centralized location with the logic. But you know, that, that to me is all like, this is the conversation I want to have. Like this is the stuff that I want to start the community talking about because you know, how are we going to handle it if we release like 500 bindings and then there's a breaking change in the API? Like, are we as a community going to have to go through and submit 500 identical pull requests? Cause that's going to suck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it seems to me like, um, um, like an approach, uh, like grams, uh, might be suited better for like a whole organization like IBM where like mm -hmm. the different teams, still have good means of communicating with, with each other. I don't know if that kind of uh, structure would um, perform, equally, uh, perform equally well in the open source community where you have a more heterogeneous environment overall and it's harder to like, really push on these standards. But um, yeah. it's, um, it's a matter of the organization and the community and, uh, and environment a little bit. And I'm really excited mm -hmm. to see like, where these technologies are headed and how the adoption is going to be in the community and like where the Grams project is headed. Like you have put up a, a website for it as well. I've uh, browsed the, the documentation which you had available there already a little bit. Um, a lot of the pages still had the TKTK abbreviation. Yeah, um, that's... I... What's TKTK actually? So TK is a, it's a, a journalism thing. Um, it's really unlikely to find TK in a block of text. Mm -hmm. And so if you are ah, writing right. and you need to come back, right, you I put in TK that. because then when you search TK, it's, it's unlikely mm -hmm. that you'll get false positives. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so the, the problem that we have is we open source Gramps and then immediately started working on like the Gramps 1.0 API. Mm -hmm. And because it's the end of the year, I've been under deadline pressure, which means that like, I haven't had any time to work on it. Um, the other problem is that we've been trying to finalize this API and there was a lot of discussion about what the right, um, what the right shape was for that API. Like how could, how should the commands be structured? Should we be using positional arguments versus named arguments, all that kind of stuff. So I think we finally have landed on an API that we can all live with. And that means that we can actually start building things because Gramps 1.0 without the CLI functions, but what really makes Gramps powerful is the, the CLI because the CLI allows you to do things like um, running a local server in mock or live data mode, uh, running it through your own custom gateway where you get all of the other data sources you're consuming, which means that you can basically run a, a full production server on your machine with all the queries you're gonna need. Um, and then also the ability to like, if you're consuming a gateway that's already got a, a data source installed on it and you were trying to run that same data source locally, um, our CLI will automatically resolve that conflict so that the local one gets used. Uh, so all, without that CLI, Gramps is hard to use. So we, we have to get that CLI out and then we can push out 1.0. And once it standardizes, I think everything will get a little bit easier because I'll, I'll be able to write docs without fear that all of it is going to be useless in, in like two commits, right? <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, so, um, before we uh, stop talking about Gramps, I would like to um, get an idea of how people can get started with it and what it actually looks like because we've talked a lot about like the major concepts, but um, mm -hmm. how do we actually use it in my code? So to use it in your code, um, all you actually have to do is uh, if you're not writing Gramps data sources, you would have your GraphQL server the same as you always would with an Apollo server and you would um, import the Gramps package, import the Gramps data sources that you wanted and then you call Gramps with an array of data sources that you want to consume mm -hmm. and a couple other uh, optional things like whether or not you want to run it with mock or live data. Um, 
you can pass some arguments to various uh, various other calls in there. But ultimately, what ends up happening is it will return the GraphQL options object that uh, the Apollo server consumes to start. Mm -hmm. So by taking in all of those different data sources, it effectively just merges them all into one uh, executable schema, one resolver's object, one mocks object, and one context object. All right. um, and so that that is all kind of handled for you, uh, which means that in order to spin it up, there's nothing additional to be done other than um, importing the so import ramps, import data sources, put them in an array, and then start your server like usual. Um, and we we worked very hard on that API to make it simple and to uh, alleviate any complexity there. Where it would get complex is if you wanted to do schema stitching, you would need to do all that schema stitching in the GraphQL server. So after you've imported everything, you would need to then add your um, like your delegation and your merging and all that into the the like completed Gramps object. You'd have to extend it with that stuff. Cool. Okay. So I think that was a pretty good roundup um, of Gramps and of the whole schema stitching topic overall. Um, super interesting conversation. So I think we are coming to the end, and we can now move on to the picks. Uh, where we just um, talk about things or uh, actually mention um, maybe one or two things uh, that makes our lives better. Um, okay. Programming related, technology related. I don't know if you prepared any picks. If you didn't, then you have time to think about some while I present mine. So okay. um, I have been aflamed a little bit because all my picks in the past have been GraphQL related. So today I'm uh, coming intentionally with a non-technical pick, and that is... Hi. Uh, homemade uh, granola cereal. So um, mm. I spent my evening yesterday to uh, make my own granola with uh, hazelnuts, walnuts, pumpkin seeds, chia seeds, all kinds of good stuff. You just put it all in a bowl. Uh, you take some coconut oil, you mix it, um, then you put um, some honey, um, uh, you put some honey on it and you can mix it all with your hands and then you just throw it in the oven um, for like half an hour and you get the best uh, homemade granola uh, that, that you can think about. Um, so <laughs> that's my uh, first pick. And then my second pick um, is uh, your uh, talk at GraphQL Summit actually. So here's another one oh. that is GraphQL related, uh, but I think that people really should watch that one. It's super interesting. Um, and especially if you want to learn about grams and schema stitching, um, then this is a great place to start. So uh, yeah, these are my picks. That's, that's very flattering. I, I appreciate it. Um, Okay, so I'll, I will also start with a food-related one because uh, that I, I love that. Nice. So uh, a cast iron skillet would be my pick. Um, what? Sorry? My, uh, a cast iron skillet. Have you ever cooked with one? Cast iron skillet. What's a skillet? I'm sorry. I'm just not uh, too... So a, skill a skillet is like a pan um, with a handle that goes on the top of the stove. Okay, I see. Mm -hmm. um, and so in the, U in the U.S. at least, I, I don't know if this is something that's common outside of the U.S., but... Uh, cooking in cast iron is a, um, you, you, you never really wash the pan with soap. You, mm -hmm. uh, you just kind of like scrape everything off and then add some, some layer of uh, fat to it. So either oil or, or lard or something. Mm -hmm. And over time, what it does is it soaks a season into the pan. Um, mm -hmm. So you get like all these great flavors just kind of baked Inside into the pan. the pan already, yeah. Um, <laughs> and so... We've been doing this, uh, this meal where we, we cook a steak, and the way that we cook that steak is, is that we uh, put the, the cast iron in the oven until it's super hot, and then you pull it out and you sear the steak on both sides, and then just lay some herbs down and put the steak on so it doesn't keep like searing, mm -hmm. and bake it for like seven to 10 minutes. And I'm not kidding, this is, the steak that we've been cooking is better than any steak I've bought in a steakhouse. <laughs> Um, and it's it, and like you got to pay money for the meat. Like we go and buy at a really good butcher to get a yeah, great sure. cut of meat. But holy crap, it's it's, it's like changed my life because I, <laughs> I was out. Well, you know, I'm out spending like sixty dollars on a steak, and I'm like sad about it because it's not the greatest steak. But then for this, you can buy a really, really, really good steak for like thirty five dollars in a butcher, yeah. and then cook it, and it tastes as good as a hundred dollar steak that you would buy at a restaurant. That's so amazing. it's just incredible. Um, so that would be my my food pick, my my technology pick. Uh, I mean, right now, probably the thing that has made me the most happy is uh, the improved testing APIs that have been coming out in Jest and Cypress and tools along those lines where um, we've been working back through some tools like 
uh, and like Mocha and Expect and Assert and Chai, they're all great libraries. Like they, they're very useful. But the challenge is that when you're new to testing, and a lot of people in, in IBM are still early in their career, they're still like younger, and so they're, they're uncomfortable with testing to begin with, and it sounds hard. So when you say, okay, you have to start writing tests, and in order to write tests, you have to import five tools. They just, they just shut down on you, right? Mm -hmm. And so by simplifying this, we're just, maybe doesn't have all of the features, but you get almost every feature you need to set up spies, to set up mocks, to set up uh, the expectation library. All of that is, is done and easy. And the same with Cypress. You, you have this really simple API to like, okay, so go here, watch this, expect this. You don't have to import these external libraries to make things work. Um, since doing that, I've been able to get almost every piece of code that I've written is 100% covered. Um, with a, a usually a blend of integration and, and unit tests and the code that we're writing as a team on average is like 80% better or, or better covered and so that has been making my life a lot easier because now we're not getting paged in the middle of the night because something broke and nobody knows why um, we have way more clarity and, and far fewer fires to put out in maintenance um, so That's that would be my pick that's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for these two picks. And um, overall, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I think it was a really great conversation and hope to talk to you soon again, Jason. All right. Thanks so much, Nico. We'll talk soon. Yeah. Bye-bye. See you.